demonstrate the Lagrange multiplier concept, let's consider an example. Here, I've used a very simple example that we probably could solve via other means, but I want to use this as a vehicle to study the Lagrange mechanism without worrying about any sort of complicated algebra or focusing more on how to solve a system of equations or something like that. So here, we have something very simple. We just want to maximize a quantity x times y subject to the constraint that the sum of x and y is less than or equal to 12. This is very common and definitely represents what we would see with, for example, a utility maximization problem in economics. Because if we look here, if we look at our constraint, this x plus y has to be less than or equal to 12, that just traces out a line in the xy space that has endpoints at x equals 12 and y equals 12. Similarly, the level sets of x times y trace out things that look like typical indifference curves that we've seen. You know, x, y is equal to some constant c1 is going to have this shape. x times y equals some constant c2 is going to have this shape. If c2 is bigger than c1, it's going to be further out, and so on and so forth. So this is a typical utility maximization type problem that we're looking at. So let's see what happens. In this case, what we were referring to as our f of x and y is simply x times y. Notice that when we were talking about our constraint g of x, y, we said that it had to be of the form g of x, y is equal to some constant. Where here we have a less than or equal to going on. But we can make the argument that if we're looking to maximize this quantity x times y, we're going to want to use up all of these 12 units that we can that it's never going to be an optimal solution where x plus y is equal to 11 or something like that because we can always add a little bit to either x or y to get a bigger value here. So intuitively at the optimum we're going to be using all of these 12 units and we can actually say that our relevant constraint is where g of x, y equals 12. Now we said that for the purposes of our Lagrange multiplier our constraint had to be something equal to zero. So you can notice here that our, what we were calling our g sub 2 of x and y is just x plus y minus 12 because that's what we want in the constraint sense to equal zero. So now that we've defined our f of x, y and our g2 of x, y, we can construct our Lagrange multiplier. And we said that this was just f of x, y plus lambda times g2 of x, y. And again, we said that it didn't actually matter whether this was a plus or a minus. We're just going to get a slightly different interpretation on this value of lambda if we use a minus rather than a plus. In our particular example, then, our script L here, our Lagrangian, is just f of x, y, which is x times y, plus lambda times x plus y minus 12. And we said what we want to do in order to solve the original constrained optimization problem is to find the extreme points of this L here which we do by taking the derivative of it and setting it equal to zero. In this case, because we have multiple unknowns, three to be exact, we have x, y, and lambda, what has to be true is the partial derivatives of L with respect to each of these variables has to equal zero. So that, that gives us three equations. We say if dL dx has to equal zero, well, that's just going to be our partial of L with respect to X is just, well, the derivative of this with respect to X is just Y. The derivative of this with respect to X, these guys are seen as constants. So the only thing multiplying X is this lambda. So you just get a plus lambda. And this has to equal zero. Similarly, the partial of our Lagrangian with respect to y has to equal zero. And again, the derivative of this with respect to y is just x. 
plus, well now the only thing that we're concerned about is this y, so the x and the 12 are constants, and the only thing multiplying the y is a lambda, so the derivative of this part with respect to y is just going to be lambda, and that also has to equal zero. Finally, we take the partial of L with respect to lambda, and we notice that that's just x plus y minus 12. And that also has to equal 0. And we notice that this last guy here is just the constraint that we originally started with. So the next step is to go through these three equations and solve for x, y, and lambda. To do that, it's probably easiest to put everything in terms of lambda and then go from there. So we can see here, if y plus lambda has to equal 0, then it has to be the case that y equals negative lambda. If it also has to be the case that x plus lambda equals 0, then it has to be the case that x equals negative lambda. And then we could plug in for x and y here to get something only in terms of lambda that we can solve. And we'll notice here that if we plug in for x and y, we get negative lambda plus negative lambda minus 12 is equal to 0. Or that's just going to be negative 2 lambda minus 12 equals 0. Or negative 2 lambda equals 12, lambda equals negative 6. Once we know that lambda equals negative 6, our x and our y are very easy. So then if lambda is negative 6, y is just negative negative 6, or 6, and x is also just negative negative 6, or 6. So we can see that our critical point, and we've only found one. Sometimes when we solve these, we might get more than one critical point, and then we'd have to test each one of them. Here we only get one. And we'd want to check and make sure that this is actually a maximum rather than a minimum. But nonetheless, we at least get to a point where we can test that pretty directly by just plugging it back into the original function. And we can see that our maximum point, our maximum xy, such that x plus y is less than or equal to 12, is in fact the point 6, comma 6. So by doing this, we found the solution to our original constrained optimization problem. We've just shown that our solution to this problem of maximizing x times y is subject to the constraint that x plus y has to be less than or equal to 12 yields a result of x being 6, y being 6, which is pretty straightforward, and also a result of a lambda of negative 6. So the last thing we want to do from an economic perspective is come back and think about the idea of this lambda or this shadow price that we talked about. So the first thing to notice is that because we're talking about lambda as a shadow price, it mostly makes sense to think about the absolute value of lambda rather than the lambda itself. And notice simply that it's the absolute value that's relevant because if we had redefined our Lagrange multiplier to use a minus lambda times the constraint rather than a plus lambda, we would have gotten the same solution for x and y, but we would have gotten a value of positive 6 here rather than negative 6. So it was just an arbitrary distinction that caused us to get this negative value, so it's really the absolute value here that we care about. And to an approximation, we can say that this lambda or this shadow price represents the additional value we could get in our objective function if we relaxed our constraint by one unit. Technically speaking, what we should be saying is if we relaxed our constraint by some infinitesimally small amount, we would get an increase in our objective function of six times that infinitesimally small amount. But to an approximation, we can say if we increase the value of this side of our constraint by one, we could increase the value of our objective function by six.
and that should be okay for most purposes. So now you're done. You've done everything that you need to with this constrained optimization. You've gotten to a solution, and you've also gotten to an interpretation of your lambda or your shadow price here. So you're all, so you're all good, and hopefully that wasn't too scary.